Good afternoon, my name is Allie Allman and it's my privilege to introduce the moderator of our last panel, Judge Lawrence Van Dyke of the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Before taking the bench, Judge Van Dyke served as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General at the Department of Justice and was the Solicitor General of two different states, Nevada and Montana. After graduating magna cum laude from Harvard Law School and clerking for Judge Janice Rogers Brown on the DC Circuit, Judge Van Dyke joined Gibson Dunn's Dallas office where he worked for a now judge we heard from this morning, Jim Ho. I've heard by rumor he also had a brief stint at the Texas Solicitor General's office, but I'll let him <laughs> defend his Texas bona fides. I had the privilege of clerking for Judge Van Dyke and actually clerked with my husband, Braden. So I can confirm two things. He's very brave and he's a great moderator. So it's my privilege to welcome him back to Texas and host the discussion on a topic that he's become very familiar with from his time on the Ninth Circuit, and that's the enforcement and non-enforcement of our immigration laws. Can you join me in welcoming Judge Van Dyke? Thank you, Allie. All right, so I don't know how many of you here are for one of the earlier panels where um, uh, Judge Branch was uh, asked, you know, why are you here? You're not on the Fifth Circuit. And she answered um, in probably the, you know, a very understandable way, which is, yeah, sure, I'm not on the Fifth Circuit, but I'm not on the Ninth Circuit either. So that was her, uh, so she threw me under the bus. So I feel like um, before we start, I have to defend my Texas uh, bona fides a little bit here. Um, and that is, uh, you, I think, well, James tried to try to defend me by saying I worked for a week in the Texas SG's office. That's not true. I worked for weeks, plural, in the Texas <laughs> SG's office um, before I uh, was had an opportunity and I got to work on, uh, under Andy Olam uh, there, amongst others, and uh, before I had an opportunity to go back to Montana and, and work as a solicitor general there. Um, but uh, I also, I guess the other, my other big Texas connection is even though I am in Nevada, I was counting it up and I think literally over half of my former clerks have um, moved to Texas after clerking for me. So I have had that, and, and none of my former clerks have gone to California. So, and even those that were from California, like Jason, ended up in Texas. So I feel like that's a strong connection. But the last connection I have is that um, I'm actually a natural born citizen of Texas. I was born in Midland, Texas. And so I think somewhere I have a Texas citizenship document. And so I have dual citizenship. Um, so I think that's a good segue into our, into our topic today. Um, we, have a, we have an amazing panel um, for this, so I'm really glad to see. I think we're going to have a strong diversity of viewpoints. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to uh, start, I'm trying to see, are we in the order? Yeah, I think we may be, no, we're not quite. All right, we're going to start with um, David uh, is going to speak first, and then followed by Trevor, Ilya, and then Matt, so we're a little bit out of order there at the end, but, and then we're going to have some rebuttal time, but I'm going to give their, uh, then I'm going to give their uh, bios. You have um, the more comprehensive bios, I think, um, on the link that we have on the website. But I'll get their bios, um, and then we'll um, and then we'll get started. We'll get out of the way. So David Donati, Donati, I'm, I'm sure I'm saying his name wrong. Uh, is is the senior staff attorney at the ACLU of Texas, former client of mine. That's another thing I, I actually represented along with with um, now Judge Ho. We represented the ACLU as our client at one point. And he's a lecturer on policy, law, and social thought at Rice University. I had each of them give me a fun fact about themselves because I figured you could read the other stuff on their bios. So last summer, David and his now fiance navigated a canoe around the buoys near Eagle Pass. So that's uh, David's fun fact. I don't know uh, what he was doing there, but I guess that's what we'll find out uh, during, the, um, during his talk. Trevor is going to be our, our next speaker. Trevor is the Deputy General Counsel to Governor Greg Abbott, where he provides strategic counseling to the state's chief executive officer on a host of matters under state and federal law, including, I'm sure, some of the issues we'll be talking about today. He's previously litigated complex disputes and in public and private practice. He clerked on the Fifth Circuit uh, for my, I think, for my former brief boss for weeks. Andy Olam, uh, Judge Olam, and then on the Sixth Circuit and the Supreme Court of the United States, and he's taught as an adjunct professor at UT Law School. And his fun fact is that before law school, Trevor played the drums for Black Bear Tribe, which I assume is the name of his band and not an uh, actual Native American That's right. tribe, uh, a prong rock band in New York City. And the last time he played was at his wedding. Is that because your wife doesn't allow you to play anymore? Or is, uh, we don't I'm have not sure. We'll find out. House, yeah. uh, so, our next speaker will be uh, Ilya Soman, and he's a professor of law at George Mason University. 
and he's the uh, B. Kenneth Simon Chair in Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute, and the author of Democracy and Polit Political Ignorance, Why Smaller Government is Smarter, and also author of Free to Move, Foot Voting, Migration, and Political Freedom. And his fun fact is that he can juggle up to four objects at once, and I assume that's a literal thing you can do, not you're just talking about like metaphorically, like uh, my wife or something like that. No, it's literal. <laughs> All right. Not and then the last the metaphorical juggling. <laughs> so I don't know if we'll get a demonstration of that today, but it depends how heated things get up here on the panel, maybe. Um, our last speaker is going to be uh, Matt Schaefer. And Matt's biography is that he is serving his sixth and final term in the Texas House of Representatives. He's an attorney in private practice in Tyler, Texas, uh, where my best man lives in Tyler right now. Um, he's the author, best, the guy that was the best man at my wedding. Um, he is the author of the landmark constitutional carry law in Texas, was instrumental in passing the ban on sanctuary cities, and he carried the controversial HB 20 Border Protection Unit Bill in 2023. He was the founding chairman of the uh, Texas House Freedom Caucus. Him and his wife, Jacelyn, have two children, and they are homeschooled. He's retired from the U.S. Navy Reserve, where he served as an intelligent officer, and he has his fun fact is that he has been named to Texas Monthly's worst list and also its best list. I assume that was not in the same month, or was that in, yeah, so maybe we'll hear some more about that. But why don't we start out, again, we'll, we'll have opening remarks from each of the panelists, and then we'll have some rebuttal time, and then be prepared for some, to have some questions. I should be a great, um, great panel. All right, well, David. Good afternoon, um, and thank you so much, Judge Van Dyke, for the introduction. Thank you to Hannah, Emily, all of the staff and organizers for making this event possible. Uh, I feel like a guest in this space, and I want to thank everyone who has helped me to feel welcome. Uh, it is no secret that I have been adverse to some of the people beside me and, and to several of the people in the audience as well. In my time at the ACLU of Texas, which is going on six years now, I have sued the Biden administration and the Trump administration for their executive orders related to immigration. For the past few years, I have worked to impose constitutional and common sense limitations on Operation Lone Star, which is a $12 billion and plus state program, which in my view has no discernible impact on migration. And I have seen firsthand the costs of that program to Texas values. Judge Van Dyke told you that I navigated a canoe around the buoys at Eagle Pass and I think very fairly said, well, what was I doing there? The answer to that question is same reason I'm here. I was invited. Uh, I was invited by people who live in Eagle Pass because it is a place where people live. It's a place where people have lived for centuries and millennia. Uh, it's a place where people live on both the Eagle Pass side and the Piedras Negras side. It's a binational community. And so what I was doing out there is I was just taking a kayak and canoeing trip, which is still something that you can do. The borderlands are a place where people live. And as a consequence of that trip, I have seen the very human costs of the state of Texas's anti-immigration enforcement programs. I know what concertina or razor wire does to human skin. I know what serial disaster or emergency proclamations mean for the rule of law. And as a civil rights lawyer, this is how we get involved. So I'd like to do something a little bit different because I do think this is a, a rare and unique opportunity when you have people on very different sides of an issue seated at a table with one another. And, and we're, unlike in court, we're not adverse to each other. We're not trying to win an argument. In my view, I'm here because I want to listen to you and I want to hold you accountable. And I want the same for myself as well. Uh, so for purposes of this discussion, and I should also say, because both Trevor and Professor Soman asked me to, I am counsel for the ACLU on the Senate Bill 4 case. That's uh, the, the Texas state law that allows state criminal prosecution for illegal entry and re-entry, as well as unlawful presence. And we can quibble about the language, but it also allows Texas to deport or remove people to the country from which they entered. So we would say deportation, but Trevor or others may describe it differently. What I would like to do is I'd actually like to tell you where I'm coming from. Uh, start with a couple of propositions, which may be controversial or not. 
The first is, in my belief, humans have a right to freedom of movement. In the language of the last panel, I can situate that right in natural law or human dignity, and I'm not the first person to believe that. People like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison believed the same thing. Uh, I believe, like them, that freedom of, freedom of movement, like free speech, is both a source of and a safeguard of other rights, and that it is fundamental. That does not mean that there are no limits. Every right has limits. I believe in property rights, too. So I believe that if you are on my private property and you're trespassing, you should be held accountable regardless of your immigration status. I also, perhaps more so than our founders, believe that borders, stable and permanent borders, are important to safeguard peace and freedom in the world we live. But I start from the premise that all of us humans have freedom of movement. And second, I believe that immigration is good. Um, I believe it's good for the United States. I believe it's good for Texas. I would not be here if it were not for immigration. My parents are immigrants from Buenos Aires. And I would not be here if their parents before them had not been immigrants. My ancestors, especially on my mother's side, they left Eastern Europe to protect themselves and their families from anti-Jewish pogroms. So that's where I come from. And because of the 14th Amendment, I am a native-born Texan and a native-born United States citizen, and that is crucial to me. I got to watch both of my parents naturalize, which is a very special and unique opportunity. And so I start from the premise that immigration is good for us economically, it's good for our diversity and prosperity. And then from those two premises, I will assert that our immigration system is broken. I probably believe that for different reasons than the other folks on this stage. But I do believe that our immigration system is not working in design or implementation. And that's partly because it hasn't been right-sized in decades. The United States Congress has not passed meaningful immigration reform, you could say, since the 1990s. I would say even further than that, since the 1980s. And as a result of that, I believe that our immigration system is broken because we don't have enough lawful pathways to citizenship. We don't have enough lawful pathways to entry, to lawful entry in the United States in safe and orderly ways. I believe our immigration system is broken because we have, in some senses, collapsed the line between civil and criminal immigration enforcement without carrying forward the due process and constitutional protections that doing so requires. And I believe that our immigration system is broken because we have not created pathways to regularization for people who are here. So Pew would say it's 11 million. If you watch our political discourse, you might think it's 25 million people are here undocumented. But we have not had a regularization of status since 1986. So we have grandparents of US citizens here who are relegated to the shadows. It is my view that that doesn't benefit them. It doesn't benefit us. There are very common sense solutions like identification and taxation that would allow for a more mutually beneficial system to emerge. And I will also assert that as much as I am critical of our immigration system, we may agree on this stage that our energies on this front should be directed at the United States Congress. And that is because we cannot go it alone. We can't go it alone as a state. We can't go it alone as a political party, there are fundamental reasons for that. Those are the fundamental reasons for which we challenged Senate Bill 4. Our nation must speak with one voice on matters of immigration and naturalization. There are questions that involve not just naturalization, but critical foreign policy questions. Just as Eagle Pass is a place, Mexico as well is a sovereign nation, and it does not, it does not do exactly what we want it to do. We have to negotiate with Mexico. And one of the reasons that I can very comfortably assert that Operation Lone Star has not had a discernible impact on migration is because I have been a student of migration patterns for the past several years. And I can tell you that as the state escalated its enforcement from 2021 through 2024, that did not impact migration flows. What meaningfully impacted migration flows was a negotiated agreement with Mexico to further police their borders. What meaningfully impacted migration is actually something that we have since sued the Biden administration about, which is their 
asylum restrictions promulgated by executive order in the summer of 2024. So there are things that we can look at and assess the implications of, and I would hold Operation Lone Star and other state efforts at enforcement to the same standards that I would hold any other massive government spending projects. I would look at them for their costs and their benefits, both fiscal and human, and by that metric, I believe that they have failed a tremendous consequence to us. Well, thank you, David. Uh, Trevor, I assume you just agree and uh, <laughs> want to cede your time. I'll try to keep it short. Uh, so thank you for having me, uh, Judge Van Dyke, my co-panelists, for helping make this an exciting conversation. Um, if I can pull up my slides. So that's my little guy there in the middle inspecting a non-justiciable question. Uh, <laughs> And amazingly, the razor blades didn't lacerate his hand, but we, had a, we also had a trip down to Eagle Pass. Um, I want to start with uh, something that, that David said, which I agree with. Uh, I'm, sh I'm sure there is an extent to which our energies need to be directed at Congress, but I think what we're talking about here today is what to do when the laws that Congress passed go unenforced. That's really, that's what Texas is involved in in this litigation over the border and a federal government that is refusing to enforce the laws that Congress has passed. I'm not sure what new, what new laws we'll do if we can't get the ones that we have currently uh, in a sensible in enforcement pattern. All right, so I'm just gonna jump right in. I'm not gonna belabor this. I think a lot of the folks in this room are aware with some of the, the actions the Biden-Harris administration have taken that have created the situation on our southern border on Moss parole right, reducing the uh, vetting of sponsors for unaccompanied minors that's created a scourge of sexual assault for young kids, um, all kinds of, of horrible things. Uh, but this is just the background for how we ended up with the litigation that I'm going to try to talk through today. I might not have a chance to get to SB4, but I'm going to focus on buoys and C-wire here. So in the, the buoy litigation starts with Governor Abbott placing a marine buoy system in the Rio Grande uh, and the United States sued under the Rivers and Harbors Appropriation Act of 1899, which prohibits placing obstructions in navigable waters. So the case boils down to the question of whether the Rio Grande is commercially navigable. So this is a snapshot from uh, marinetraffic.com, which does live time tracking of commercial freight shipping. Uh, this is from yesterday at 10 a.m. And you'll see that the Rio Grande's, you know, it's got no activity. You might say, well, Trevor, that's just a snapshot. Is it like this all the time? Here's a backward-looking heat map. Uh, you see lots of activity on the St. Lawrence, right, the Ohio River, the Mississippi. There's nothing going on in the Rio Grande. Is knee-deep water outside of Eagle Pass commercially navigable? That's what this case is about. So the district court granted a preliminary injunction, uh, uh, basically granting the United States' request to enjoin the buoys. Uh, Fifth Circuit panel initially affirms that injunction. The en banc court eventually grants en banc rehearing, re and the next day the district court says, well, you know what, we're going to go to a trial in six weeks, actually. Uh, Texas seeks review from the Fifth Circuit, and the Fifth Circuit essentially says, what on earth are you doing? Uh, and so the trial has been slow rolled for, for a while, uh, and a, a big opinion just came out from the en banc court uh, not too long ago, saying essentially three things. One, when the Rivers and Harbors Appropriation Act asks about navigable waters, they have to be navigable as a highway, right? That the water, you use it to go up and down the stream. You don't cross the river. When you cross a river, you're actually traversing it as an obstacle the same way that a bridge does or a ferry does. Second, they said there's no evidence of past navigation. Uh, the United States' own evidence said that there was no history of navigation above Roma, Texas, which is 300 river miles south of Eagle Pass. And they said the United States produced no evidence of how, what, what reasonable costs would be to make the river navigable, like blowing it up like the Panama Canal and filling it with water. Uh, status update right now, just yesterday the Fifth Circuit denied Texas's jury demand, uh, and the parties are currently briefing whether or not Judge Willett's opinion is actually a majority or controlling opinion because the district court judge thought it might not be. Next, I'm going to talk about Seawire. So uh, beginning in spring of 2023, uh, the federal government started uh, just tearing up and destroying uh, state property. So the state of Texas has 
uh, deployed sea wire on its own land, on private land, where it has land use agreements with property owners. Um, and in an escalating pattern of, of property damage, the federal government, uh, and I'll play this just in the background, uh, just started tearing stuff up. On this particular day, September 20th, they tore the fence open in repeated places and waved 4,000 aliens illegally into the United States. So Texas sued uh, as a plaintiff in this case, uh, alleging trespass to chattel and conversion theory uh, that the United States had essentially just destroyed the, the private property of a proprietary property owner, which just happened to be the state of Texas. Um, in this case, the, the district court grants a TRO, concludes that the uh, federal government uh, has engaged in t culpable and duplicitous conduct and betrays an utter failure to deter, prevent, and halt unlawful entry to the United States. But it eventually denies a preliminary injunction because it believed the lawsuit was barred by sovereign immunity. That case went up to the Fifth Circuit. A Fifth Circuit panel said, nope, 5 U.S.C. Section 702 plainly waives sovereign immunity in an action in federal court seeking non-monetary relief, and intergovernmental immunity did not bar the lawsuit uh, because as a general matter, federal officers operating inside of a state are actually subject to that state's laws. So federal employees and agents cannot just go perpetrate murder out here in downtown Fort Worth and not be prosecuted for murder. There's a narrow exception when a state tries to discriminate against federal actors or regulate them as a sovereign what you need to see in this case is the United States' argument would mean if any of you, we just talked about importance of property rights, if any of you ever tried to sue the federal government in tort for them bulldozing your house, the, the Fed's argument here would be, well, you're trying to regulate us. You can't do that. They have argued that they have the authority to destroy property whenever they want within 25 miles of the border, which in Texas amounts to a square area the size of South Carolina. I'm not going to dip into SB4 because I'm probably short on time, so I'm going to jump to some ways in which uh, our federal government friends on the other side have not submitted these disputes to peaceable re resolution the way that we have. So in the buoy litigation, the federal government argued that Texas is in violation of several treaties. Um, at one point, they argued that the buoys were actually in Mexican waters. That's not true. And one way that we know it's not true is the current delineation of the international boundary uh, they are five years out of compliance with the international treaty. There is no current, existent, knowable international boundary in the Rio Grande because the federal government has not abided its treaty obligations to update the boundary every 10 years. Uh, second, water allocation. They have done nothing to ensure that, uh, that Mexico provides water to Texas growers. The last sugar mill in Texas closed this year, and next year we may lose 50% of our citrus production. And then number three, IBWC has admitted that it's currently releasing 35 to 45 million gallons of raw sewage into border waters. That's something it's tasked with preventing under treaties. Let's talk about property damage. So when Texas sued in the Sea Wire case to submit their destruction of our, of our property to a peaceable resolution, they showed up with that tractor on the left, hydraulic power tractor, tore the fence out of the ground, held it in the air for 30 minutes, and waved 300 people into the United States. When Texas contacted the federal government and said, hey, we're going to need to go seek a TRO here, the Fed said, please don't. And to paraphrase the former president, the conversation basically went like that conversation with Putin. No way. Way. So we sought a TRO. Uh, 20 minutes after we sought the TRO, they came back with the forklift and this time smashed it into the ground until it was a pulverized mass of just tangled and destroyed metal. Um, let's talk about representations in court. So after the Fifth Circuit uh, granted the injunction the district court denied, uh, the federal government sought emergency relief from the Supreme Court, even though the Fifth Circuit had granted the expedited briefing schedule they requested, and purported to argue that uh, some actions Governor Abbott took in the interim uh, prevented them from accessing the border and actually prevented them from rescuing some people who tragically drowned. Uh, in, in a lull of activity in Shelby Park, Governor Abbott took some steps to ensure that the park would not again become an unlawful port of entry uh, for staging thousands of people. Um, in the Supreme Court, they made representations about, you know, they seized this two and a half mile area, we can't see the border anymore. Uh, it won't surprise you to learn that many of those were false. If the federal government would just look down, they could see the border because there are two ports of entry directly above the area in question. Um, other representations up here that we could talk through, but we don't have time. The real 
the real kicker, though, is how could they get so many things wrong? And the answer to that question is because the sole declarant they relied on in the Supreme Court of the United States was 2,000 miles away in Detroit, Michigan, had no personal knowledge of the allegations they were making, and never took the time to inform the Supreme Court of that. I think I'm up on time there. I'll pause. All right. Well, all right, thank you, Trevor. And I guess we're going we're gonna to jump over to Matt. We're going to go over to Ilya. Uh, thanks to Judge Van Dyke for running this panel and the Federalist Society for organizing it and all of you for coming. Uh, I guess I have less Texas credentials than almost any other member of the panel. However, I did quirk right here in the state of Texas for Judge Jerry Smith, who uh, was just uh, spoken in the previous panel. So uh, I do have that connection. And so what I don't have in uh, quantity of Texas connections, maybe I somewhat make up for uh, in quality. Uh, but in this presentation, I'm going to focus on two aspects of the border situation. There are many others that I could talk about, but there just isn't the time. One is a problematic and I think very dangerous argument that the state of Texas has advanced both in the water buoy case and in the SB4 case, the idea that illegal migration and drug smuggling qualify as invasion. I'm going to suggest that's wrong and also that if the courts accept it, it would have dire and dangerous implications. Uh, and then at the end, I'll talk briefly about how the border situation can be best managed by making legal migration easier rather than by states trying to engage in some sort of crackdown or even the federal government uh, doing so. Uh, so in both of these cases, uh, Texas has advanced a range of different arguments, but a big one that they've made is that they say uh, they can disobey even otherwise applicable federal laws uh, because illegal migration and drug smuggling qualify as invasion. And Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3 of the Constitution states that no state shall, without the consent of Congress, engage in war unless actually invaded or in such imminent danger as will not admit of delay. Uh, so they say, you know, if this is an invasion, then they can engage in war in response. And if they can engage in war, then certainly they can do things like put up water buoys or pass SB4 uh, and the like. Uh, and I think the big problem with this argument uh, is that invasion is not simply illegal migration or drug smuggling. It has to be an organized military attack. Uh, I and others have gone through all of the founding era sources on this from the ratification of the Constitution, the Constitutional Convention. Whenever this invasion clause is discussed, it's pretty clear it's in reference to actual acts of war. And indeed, James Madison, uh, one of the principal framers of the Constitution, specifically said that invasion is, quote, an operation of war, illegal migration uh, or drug smuggling does not qualify as such. Moreover, if this argument is accepted, uh, then it has two dire implications. One is that as the text of the invasion clause states, states could indeed engage in war in response to drug smuggling or illegal migration. And since there has been substantial drug smuggling and illegal migration throughout the entire time that we've had the war on drugs, and also throughout the entire time that we've had uh, significant migration restrictions, that pretty much means that states States would have the power, even without federal consent, to drag us into a war uh, any time that they want. And I would add, this is not just a purely theoretical danger that sort of uh, egghead law professors can come up with. Uh, this is something that could actually happen, because over the last year, uh, a variety of Republican politicians, including various presidential candidates, advocated using military force to try to prosecute the war on drugs in Mexico. Uh, so this risk actually exists. Uh, the second dire implication is that the Constitution and the suspension clause also suggest that the, that doesn't suggest, it says that the writ of habeas corpus can be suspended anytime there is an invasion. Uh, that is, uh, when the writ is suspended, that means the federal government can detain people without charges and without trial. Uh, and once again, if uh, illegal migration or drug smuggling qualifies as an invasion, then this this means the federal government uh, can do this pretty much any time that they want. And by the way, this power is not limited to immigrants or to non-citizens. Uh, it would apply to US citizens uh, as well. Uh, I don't know about you, uh, but I don't trust either
either Kamala Harris or Donald Trump with that kind of power, the power to suspend uh, the writ of habeas corpus uh, any time that they might want. Uh, now, it is sometimes argued, well, illegal migration does pose a great security threat or whatnot. Uh, I think whatever threat there is, uh, it simply does not rise anywhere uh, near the level of an invasion or a threat of war. For example, the threat of terrorism is sometimes raised. Uh, as my colleague at the Cato Institute, Alex Navraste, has shown, the total number of Americans killed by uh, terror and acts of terrorism by people who cross the southern border illegally throughout the entire last 50 years years for which we have data, that number is zero. Uh, that doesn't suggest there's no risk whatsoever, but it does mean the risk is just nowhere near enough to qualify as invasion. And similarly, ordinary criminal activity, like for instance, cross-border drug smuggling, that may be a bad thing, uh, but it is not uh, an invasion. Uh, and that leads us to the broader issue of, well, how do we deal with genuine problems that exist at the border? I think the key is to understand th the cause of the disorder and other problems, and that is that we've created a vast illegal market by making it virtually impossible for many people f fleeing opportunity, fleeing poverty, oppression, socialism, and so forth uh, to enter legally, and therefore their only option is to do so illegally, and therefore we have a vast illegal market, just as we did with alcohol prohibition when the federal government made it virtually impossible to get alcohol legally, but many people still wanted it, and so you end up with Al Capone cross-border uh, uh, smuggling of alcohol and so forth. Uh, and so we have the same thing now with uh, illegal migration. This can be alleviated by making legal migration easier, and in fact, data shows that when legal migration is is made easier, that there are fewer, many fewer illegal border crossings from people from those countries, like with the program that the Biden administration created for uh, citizens of Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, and Haiti, people fleeing horrible communist oppression in the first three of those countries uh, when the administration created that program uh, to make it easier for them to enter illegally. That massively reduced illegal border crossings from those countries. Unfortunately, there is a cap of 30,000 per month for all four countries combined. Uh, so that cap was exceeded, uh, and once there was a many years long waiting list in that program, you saw uh, predictably legal border crossings from people from those countries uh, rise again. Uh, and for some of the reasons David mentioned and others, uh, letting more legal migration occur is good not just for the migrants and for reducing problems at the border, it's also good for our economy and for our society uh, and also saves people fleeing horrible oppression. Uh, for example, immigrants disproportionately contribute to entrepreneurship and innovation of almost every kind. They also improve the fiscal position of the government. A recent study by the Congressional Budget Office uh, indicates that increases in migration since 2021 will save the federal government close to a trillion dollars over the next 10 years. Uh, so obviously there are other issues at stake in these cases, which I don't have time to do justice to uh, right now. But I think uh, even if you do ultimately conclude that say Texas can put up the water buoys because it's not really a navigable body of water there and the Rivers and Harbors Act doesn't apply, that may be fine. Uh, but I hope courts will resist the temptation to accept the terrible and dangerous invasion argument, which so far none of them have. Uh, and I hope ultimately we can recognize that the way to address our broader problems uh, is not through uh, you know, having a bigger crackdown on a, uh, of a kind that has you know, repeatedly failed in the past and has made the situation crueler and worse, but rather by making legal migration easier. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ilya. And uh, Matt, why don't we go ahead and have you finish up the first round here. Where to start? Oh, I, I will politely disagree with my colleagues on a couple of points here. Mexico is not sovereign. The cartels are sovereign. You mentioned Mexico policing its own border. They have no capacity to police their own border. They have no capacity to do anything except what the cartels allow them to do. Who decides who crosses the Texas border? It's not the ACLU. It's not Greg Abbott. It's not the United States government. It's the Mexican cartels. 
They decide. They decide. If uh, you want to say the invasion clause is just about illegal immigration and drug smuggling, I would agree with you. But what do you call over 100,000 Americans dead by homicide through poisoning by fentanyl? What do you call it when you talk to a woman who lives at the border, who does yard work, wearing a pistol with three German shepherds by her side? because MS-13 gang members come across their ranch, if that's not an invasion? What do you call it with people who live along the river are afraid because people come across and they rattle their windows at night? Where's the peace and security? When Americans are dying, when Texans are dying, that qualifies as a time for security, okay? We believe that our country was founded upon the idea of inalienable rights that come to us from God, a right to self-defense, okay? Well, we believe that the executive at the federal government has a right to go defend the United States. We believe, do you think that the founding fathers, the colonists would have formed the federal government knowing that a state would lose its authority to protect its own border when its citizens were being poisoned to death? Article 1, Section 10 means something, imminent danger. And let's talk about war. Because war is not always about kinetic activity, launching bombs, killing people. Sometimes it's just about deterrence, about holding a position so that your people can be safe. That's a big part of war. War is these huge periods of waiting and nothing happening, followed by periods of violence. Cartels are committing extreme acts of violence. I spent time on the Iranian border in Afghanistan and as an intelligence officer, and what I saw there is, reminds me of the extreme violence that's happening just across the river uh, from our communities in Texas. It's extreme violence. We know where the uh, poison is coming from. Look at the rooms in this, uh, in this uh, look at the doors in this room, okay? Just imagine if, if the men at this table were the only ones with the authority to keep these doors open or closed. And through this door, all the poison is coming in. And through all these doors, people are coming in. We'd say, we're going to close these doors temporarily so that we can stop the poison coming in over there. You cannot separate the immigration problem from the people dying of fentanyl problem because we only have so many resources with which to keep our people safe. The cartels know about this. They are making billions of dollars off of people being poured across ankle-deep water in Del Rio, Texas. And when Ted Cruz held up a bag full of wristbands, the the, the secretary... uh, uh, Mayorkas didn't even know what they were. He had no clue what was happening at the border to these people. Talk to some of those ranchers and and sit like I have with them, and they'll pull out pictures of dead bodies on their ranch, women tied to a tree. Women's undergarments hung by trees as trophies from the coyotes. That's not war and insecurity. I don't know what is. As a legislator, here's here's my difficulty. I do think this is a political question. Did you hear the, uh, the Fifth Circuit judge bristle at the notion of interfering with their shuttle docket when they decided something was an emergency? You think they want Congress passing a law telling them what they can have on their shuttle docket? Do you want the President of the United States to be told by Congress when an attack is imminent or not? This is a political question. Read Judge Ho's opinion. And oh, by the way, the same Biden administration or the same Barack Obama administration would tell you that when they decided to kill United States citizens in Yemen because they were imminent threats to our security as enemy combatants, These guys were not even sitting outside of a base in Iraq or Afghanistan about to shoot somebody. They were just planning bad stuff 
And we killed them. And then when they went to court, the ACLU sued, the ACU, the, the, the federal government said, you know what, this is a political question. This is not a question for the courts. Article 1, Section 10 is a political question. It goes to the fundamental issue of why government exists, and it's to protect its citizens. Now, let me tell you where this federal society can come help a little bit. Because we saw this come to a head last session when we tried to pass HB 20. I'm a legislator. If I talk to my colleagues about pro-life issues, they could rattle off Roe v. Wade or Casey, and they could talk to you about maybe even penumbras and emanations and the right to privacy, and they could talk to you about some law. They could talk to about the Second Amendment. They could rattle off the exact words of the Second Amendment. When I talk to my 150 colleagues on the House floor, do you know how many of them have ever even read Article 1, Section 10? before that day on the floor. Now, a few of them had heard of Arizona v. U.S. Fewer still had ever read it. Because immigration law has not been the field of study for conservatives over the years. And so we have this lack of knowledge among members on the Constitution, on federal immigration law. And yet we have people dying in our country because of these issues and the government's failure. So what is the role of state government? And what is the role of our governor trying to defend our citizens? And because we're the front line, trying to then be a protecting force for the rest of the country. We can dispute these legal matters all we want to, but people are dying. And when that happens, we expect our president to do something immediately. We should expect our governor to do something immediately. But because we do obey the rule of law, we're going to let it work out in court. But we are risking societal cohesion. When you allow millions of people to take up residence without assimilating, without a gradual period of being part of our country, they come from parts of the world where a rules-based economy doesn't exist. Payola is the way it works. And they come here and they're, just, they're here in mass now. And they're in our schools and in their neighborhoods. And we are a country of immigrants. But societal cohesion is being ripped apart. Thank you, Matt. We're going to uh, have a little bit of uh, response time from each of the panelists. But I want to make sure we have time for question and answer. So I'm hoping the response time will be about 10 minutes total. So we can have plenty of time. If you don't want to just hear me ask all the questions, feel free to line up to the, I have a, some, a few, but I want to, I think this is probably something that people in the room uh, have some thoughts on. And so uh, line up to ask questions, but let's go ahead. Maybe, I guess we'll probably go in the same order if that's, if that's all right with, with um, you, David. We'll start with you and go in the same order again. Yeah, sure thing, thank you. Um, I'm not honestly sure where to begin. And I am so deeply sympathetic to Trevor and Representative Schaefer who are looking at these issues and who feel as strongly about them as I do, truly. Uh, but I'd like to address a couple of things head on. The first, Mexico is indeed sovereign. It is indeed sovereign. Not only is Mexican sovereign, it is our number one trade partner for the state of Texas. Not only is Mexico sovereign, but it has, by all accounts, precipitated the drop in migration numbers for the past several months. And they can change their mind. They can do things differently than we do it. But even if you don't think that Mexico is sovereign, and I will say I am very glad, although I respect Representative Schaefer, that you are not in charge here. Because I do not want to go to war with Mexico. That is the last thing I want to do. Go to war with our number one trade partner that I, I believe that something on the order of 30 plus percent of Americans are of Mexican heritage. The idea of going to war with our next door neighbor is calamitous to our stability and our security. And that's a fundamental point that I want to articulate for everything that we think about. Because there are costs and consequences to every policy. There are financial costs and there are human costs. And so we can say, Yes, this is a dire situation and we need to act aggressively, but what I would hope and expect from our legislators, 
our policymakers, our friends at state agencies and the governor's office is that they take very seriously these costs and these consequences. Because in addition to the absolute harm that I think Representative Schaefer rightly identifies, uh, I'll, I'll take his number as a given that 100,000 people died from fentanyl overdoses. What I will disagree with absolutely and unequivocally is that that issue is inseparable from immigration. Of course it is separable from immigration. People who have looked at this will tell you that the vast, overwhelming majority of drugs come through ports of entry. I have seen so many migrants at the southern border and all they're carrying is a Ziploc bag with identification documents. They are not carrying fentanyl. We have asked the state of Texas for its own analyses of Operation Lone Star. The Department of Public Safety will tell you that they arrested 44,000 people since 2021 under Operation Lone Star. We crunched those numbers. It's hard to figure out where they're coming from. The court system will tell you it's closer to 13,000. But either way you cut it, even if you look at the higher numbers from the Department of Public Safety, the overwhelming majority of people who have been arrested under Operation Lone Star are arrested for no crime other than misdemeanor trespass. They are not arrested for violent crimes, they are not arrested for human smuggling, and they are not arrested for drugs. And the problem becomes even more severe when you realize that when we talk about immigration, we are not just talking about migrants at the border, we are talking about border communities where 10% of Texans live. Trevor mentioned Shelby Park, and I think you could be forgiven for assuming that Shelby Park is an operationalized staging area for the Department of Public Safety, and right now it is. But until two years ago, it was also a vibrant public park. It was a place where communities lived, worked, prayed, and continue to attempt to do so under the watchful eye of the state and drones. And for me at the ACLU, we are looking at these issues both from the perspective of migrants, because to be clear, migrants have the right to apply for asylum and refuge under United States law, and I'm quoting whether or not they enter between ports of entry, regardless of their status. And that is United States law. If you don't like it, take it up with Congress. But you do not, as a state, take matters upon yourself and deprive people of their rights under United States and international law. The other thing that I will say is that whether or not you believe that Mexico is sovereign, the United States is sovereign. The United States should have the prerogative of determining if and when we are at war. And states should, as Texas has done, communicate their disagreement. They should fight like hell to make it so that Congress is responsive to their demands. And in critical ways, I would say the state of Texas has been successful. I look at the landscape now, and you can call it an open border all you want. That's not my perspective. President Biden is on track to deport as many people as President Trump. The last I saw, it was 1.1 million to President Trump's 1.4 million, and that's not counting the over 3 million people who were excluded under Title 42 during the Biden administration. Because even though we sued about Title 42, the Biden administration did not repeal that program until May of 2023. The Biden administration continues to prosecute people for illegal entry and re-entry following the same Operation Streamline practices that I as a civil rights lawyer have taken substantial issues with over the years. The budgets of these agencies continue to balloon. CBP and ICE combined are getting about $30 billion a year to do their work, and it's not just them. It is alcohol, tobacco, firearms. It's the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And look, I'm not here to defend the Biden administration. We're suing them too. If I had a nickel for every time the federal government, whether under President Biden or President Trump, lied or made misrepresentations in court, I would have a lot of nickels. I am deeply frustrated with these people. And in just a closing note, because I know that this is a long, a long spiel, um, sometimes, our, sometimes our interests overlap. So I will say, I got my start on these issues when I was still a private lawyer in New York City representing a landowner at the border who was suing about property damage to their property from the federal government. And the federal government cited the exact same authorities that they're citing in the razor wire case 
well, we have the authority to police private property within 25 miles of the border. And it doesn't matter how much we destroy it, how much damage we do. And that is an authority that we sued under the Trump administration, but Texas is suing under the Biden administration. It is a troubling authority. I'd welcome an amicus brief. If you want to buy one. <laughs> sure thing. I'd, I'm no longer counsel on that case. But <laughs> this is to say that our issues, our issues are not they're not diametrically opposed to one another. And for several people in this room, if an appeal to the fundamental humanity of migrants doesn't resonate with you, then perhaps an appeal to liberty and due process and the rule of law may. All right, thank you, Dave. Trevor? All right, I'll try to be quick. Can I get my slides back up when you have a moment, sir? Uh, I want to start by acknowledging that I do agree with David that it's a, I care that people live there um, and that lawful immigration is good. My wife is a naturalized citizen. I was born in the Rio Grande Valley. I am Mexican-American, and my cousins still live in the area, and they are, uh, you know, I think, I think they would be very much thankful for Operation Lone Star, a lot of work, work in Border Patrol. So um, definitely different perspectives down there than, than the ones I think you relate up here. Um, I want to start by responding to our libertarian friends gathered here. Uh, just look at, look at the maybe the three cases that we talked through earlier: buoys, sea wire, SB four, buoys. I thought I thought we thought a profligate commerce clause was a bad thing, but here we're talking about federal statutory authority based on trafficking in human beings and drugs. Uh, sea wire. I thought property rights were important, um, but apparently federal government can just go destroy it anytime it wants. SB four. I thought we were against centralized federal power, and we were for. Uh, states experimenting and not being whipsawed by changing federal enforcement priorities. Uh, so personally, I think we should have had a Cato amicus brief in every single one of these Texas cases. I'm surprised we didn't get one. Um, let's talk about OLS data. Um, obviously, it's expensive, but Governor Abbott has reduced immigration into Texas by 70%. Doesn't mean that it's reduced it everywhere else, but I think it's shown that those tactics are successful and they've pushed illegal immigration elsewhere. Um, and I was, I was grateful to hear David share that he cares so much about U.S. statutory law when he's talking about the asylum statute. And I'm curious what you think about the provisions that require the federal government to obtain operational control, which means zero crossings, and the provisions that make it a crime to enter uh, the federal government is just ignoring. Do we care about those two? I want to respond briefly to Professor Soman on the self-defense clause. I'm not going to belabor this. This is the text. You can review it later. Um, Honestly, it's not really close. It kind of speaks for itself, right? States have expressed authority to engage in war without the consent of Congress when actually invaded, right? And you'll notice when you have more time to review this that it parallels these other two provisions that speak about threats from without and threats from within. Um, why that's important is under Supreme Court precedent, the nature of the power that is lodged in state government and federal government is the same. and it's for that reason that it's non-justiciable, short of a good faith assessment of whether the, 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 that war power has been invoked in good faith. Let's go back to historical practice real briefly. I think uh, the conversation my colleagues had earlier about Mexican sovereignty is actually germane here. Um, so in the 1870s, the governor of Texas uh, was dealing with problems not unlike the, the ones that we're dealing with today and commissioned two companies of Texas Rangers gave them orders to pursue criminals crossing from Mexico back across the border. Uh, federal government found out about it, contacted him, and said, hey, what are you doing? You might be violating some federal criminal laws. He writes them a letter, says, hey, I've been asking you under Article 4, Section 4 to provide help for a long time, and you've refused. Mexico is a sovereign nation, but every nation under the law of nations has a concomitant responsibility because it's territorially sovereign to prevent excursions from its territory into a neighboring state. And a nation state that does that forfeits its status as a friendly nation. What do we call, as David put it, a trade partner that allows its own nationals to come into your country and kill your people? That's a weird trade partner. It might be a malicious one. It might be a weak one. I want to go back to something that Professor Soman said earlier about zero terrorist deaths caused by illegal immigration. We might have a definitional problem there. Bill Barr wrote a great op-ed in the Wall Street Journal talking about how the cartels withstood the Mexican military with tanks. Um, he may not have read anything about Tren de Agua, which the governor just designated a terrorist organization last week.
What about the guy in Fronten Island who was killed while fishing? That's someone who lives there. So this is, this is Professor Soman back in, is this December of 23? About the Colorado. Uh, so Professor Soman at the time said, January 6th, definitely insurrection. January 6th participants, definitely enemies of the United States. Terrorists crossing into the United States, not an invasion. I would remind you to look back at these constitutional provisions and see that those two things are treated as triggering the same war power authority, right? Insurrection and invasion. For some reason, one of them doesn't qualify. Can we please go to the video and I'll close with that? So the context here, this is a thermal imaging picture captured by the Texas Department of Public Safety. This is Fronten Island. Uh, it's an island down uh, closer to the mouth of the Rio Grande. And what you're going to see are some Mexican cartel members lighting. Uh, there's it's lit, throwing, and then detonating explosives within Texas's sovereign territory. Is that an invasion? I don't know, maybe it's in the eye of the beholder, but I'm thankful that some of my co-panelists who don't think that's an invasion are not the commander in chief of this state. All right, thank you, Trevor. Ilya. Yeah, so I know time is short, so I'll just try to cover uh, three issues. One is fentanyl, the war on drugs generally, and then finally invasions and political questions. Uh, so yes, thousands of people die of fentanyl overdoses every year. That's just simply not an invasion or an act of war. There is a fundamental difference between a real invasion, such as, for instance, Vladimir Putin's attack on Ukraine or Hamas's attack on Israel, where people are killed by force versus when people of their own volition take a dangerous drug, assume a risk, uh, and then you know perhaps it turns out to be a bad decision or a social problem, but it is not an invasion. It is not an act of war. Uh, if it was, then it would be war invasion anytime people shorten their lives by smoking too much or by eating uh, too much fatty foods or by, yes, uh, you know the argument used for alcohol prohibition was that some people uh, drink themselves to death. This might be a tragedy. It might be a social problem, uh, but it is simply not an invasion or an act of war, and the attempt to analogize the two is part of a dangerous trend of trying to assimilate all sorts of social problems into warfare with the idea that then for that reason we can set aside civil liberties and restraints on government power in the way that we normally do uh, only during real wars. Moreover, as has been mentioned already by David, uh, most of the uh, fentanyl trafficking is actually at ports of entry by U.S. citizens, so it's distinct from illegal migration. I would add also that the real cause, the most fundamental cause of the fentanyl problem is actually the war on drugs. Drugs, just as the most of the problems during prohibition were caused by prohibition itself, uh, people have ended up using fentanyl, a more potent drug than was used before, in largely because of what scholars call the iron law of prohibition, uh, which is that when you uh, make various kinds of drugs illegal, there is a tendency for people to take stronger drugs, which give you a bigger hit, uh, and also obviously for them to uh, you know, acquire drugs that don't have safeguards or uh, don't have quality control and the like. So uh, the better way to address this and other problems related to the war on drugs is in fact to cut back on the war on drugs rather than to expand it and to make what is a metaphorical war uh, into a real war, which is the implication of Texas's argument that wouldn't save lives, that would predictably kill more people, as indeed the war on drugs sadly has already killed many thousands of people, uh, both uh, here and abroad. And by the way, for concern about cartels, the reason why cartels exist, uh, drug cartels are the same reason why Al Capone's organized crime operation existed 
It's because of, in one case, prohibition, in the other case, the war on drugs, that when you forbid legal markets in substances that people want, you predictably get illegal ones, uh, and the illegal, illegal ones can be on a large scale. Uh, so uh, I think the lesson here is not that we should expand the war on drugs into a real war, but that we, we should maybe rethink the war on drugs that we already have, uh, which is bad enough. On the issue of uh, the definition of invasion being a political question. The whole political questions doctrine is kind of a mess, as many of you have covered it in constitutional law know. Uh, I think it would be very dangerous to say that either the federal government or the state governments uh, have uh, an untrammeled power to determine what counts an invasion without judicial review, uh, th then they could just declare an invasion anytime they want, which would give them the power to uh, suspend the writ of habeas corpus anytime they want, to engage in war, even without a declaration of war anytime they want. I don't think this is uh, the kind of massive, dangerous concentration of power that the founding fathers wanted, and it's certainly not something that we should accept today. But if the definition of invasion is a political question, then at the very least, it's a political question for the federal government, not a question that any state government can just decide on its own with the result that any individual state can drag the United States into war uh, at any time they want. And it's certainly not a rationale for an individual state government to be able to resist otherwise applicable uh, federal laws. Finally, on insurrection versus invasion, uh, I remain unrepentant in attack on the Capitol for the purpose of overthrowing the government and keeping in power somebody who lost an election is pretty obviously an insurrection uh, by any reasonable definition of the word. Uh, I refer you, for instance, to my article on this that just came out in the Cato Supreme Court review, but I don't think you actually need a lot of complicated legal arguments to see that. On the other hand, drug smuggling, cross-border uh, uh, illegal migration and the like, those things are not wars or insurrections or invasion. They may be bad things. They may be social problems. You can disagree with me about how best to address them, uh, but they simply are not the same thing uh, as the use of force to overthrow the government. They just aren't. Thank you. Thank you, Ilya. Matt? Overdose is not what we're dealing with here. Um, this is not about people just trying to get high. Fentanyl, with an amount small enough just, just for the head of that little pencil lead right there, laced into what a college student thinks is just an Adderall they pick up at a party, they're not trying to overdose uh, on some hard drug. You mentioned Adderall Adderall's not a dangerous drug. It's, it's a common use drug. I didn't mention Adderall. Uh, but, but, but the point mm -hmm. of it is is that this is homicide. We actually now have state courts prosecuting these cases based on homicides. It's not, you, don't, you don't prosecute overdoses as homicides, okay? Um, this is poison and, and a phenomenon that's happening like it's never happened in our country before. It's a hockey stick on the graph, folks. This is bigger than Viet how many people died in the Vietnam War. So to just dismiss this as, ah, you know, it's overdoses, it's a cultural issue, it's illegal drug smuggling. People are being killed. Um, I don't want to go to war with Mexico. I, I don't know where you get that suggestion. I, I want to stop the chaos at the river, at the river. And if I was king for a day, I'd go to Del Rio where the water is ankle deep, we're coming across in mass, and I would meet them with medical personnel, sack lunches, water, and instructions in multiple languages, and I would escort them right back across the ankle deep water with instructions to walk about 20 minutes down the way to the port of entry, in no way interfering with their rights to claim asylum. In no way. But I would bring peace and security back to the people of Del Rio. That's what I would do. But we're not killing Mexican citizens. But there are Mexican cartel members killing Americans. Um, we we want to buy tomatoes at HEB that are grown in Mexico. 
the, the, we, we are conjoined twins with the Mexican economy. We understand that. We love our Mexican friends. And I think it's good for Mexico. I think it's good for Americans if there is peace and security and order in the immigration process. And right now you have chaos and death. And it's, it's, it's tearing our society apart. It's the number one issue in these races. And it is hard on communities. And it's hard on the countries they're fleeing from because economists will tell you the only way an economy grows is an increase in working age adults or increase in productivity. Those are the only two fat components in GDP growth. And when all those countries empty out their working age adults, it is a perpetual cycle of, of going downhill in, in those countries. We don't do uh, Guatemala or Honduras or El Salvador or any favors by just being a welcoming committee for all their working age adults. Their country has no chance when their people are just being given free bus tickets to wherever they want to go. And in California, they'll get uh, money for a new house. It's not going to work. All right. Thank you, Matt. And thank you all. Um, I have done a terrible job of moderating this panel. <laughs> and um, notwithstanding that, what everybody said is very interesting. Um, and nobody's lined up the mics, which is probably good because we're about out of time. But I do want to, I will ask one question. I think there's so much agreement about one thing across the aisle by everybody, all, all the branches, is that our immigration system is terribly broken. And I, don't, I think that's one thing we can all agree with. I am curious to hear from each of you, and I didn't give any warning that I asked a question like this, so hopefully this doesn't catch you, but if you could wave a magic wand and make one discrete change, either that came from Congress or from um, the executive branch or from the judiciary, because I, you know, I, I haven't been shy about saying I think the judiciary has contributed to this broken system, what is that one discrete thing that you would change to try to fix something? I guess let's go down the line. Yeah, I appreciate that. And it's a tough question because it is very systemic, right? There's so many things that we have touched on, all of which need to be addressed. If I could wave a magic wand and do one thing, I would increase lawful pathways to visas in the United States. And would that be through, through Congress? Through, you through Congress? Absolutely. And I think if there is one takeaway... It is, from, from my perspective, it is that these issues need to be debated in Congress, that we need to hold Congress accountable to make legislation for us, because the system of perennial executive orders or states going it their own way or feeling like they have to defend themselves is not working. And the reason that I identified visas at the border uh, is, I think, twofold. Representative Schaefer is right that people should not be crossing between ports of entry. We want an orderly immigration system where people are going to the bridges. The problem is that that's not attainable for most people and that as a result of that not being attainable, they are obligated in many circumstances to wait in very dangerous Mexican communities. We can agree northern Mexico is a very dangerous place for people to wait. I also agree, ideally, people would stay in their home countries, and I think ideally for them, too. It, very few people want to leave the place that they're from. I think everyone here loves the place that they're from. And I also don't think that immigration needs to be permanent. But right now, we are in a situation where 8 million people have been displaced from Venezuela, where Port-au-Prince in Haiti is under gang control, and so... So much of these issues are temporary, but they are being driven by very real needs. And our response, in my opinion, according to my values, simply cannot be, well, tough cookies, that's too bad. It has to be something that accounts for both our safety, the orderliness of our process, but also the very real needs that people in our hemisphere and beyond are facing. Because truly, I believe that that is necessary for our prosperity, who we are as a nation, but also for our security. All right, thank you. Trevor? Well, I, I think one way to think about your question is a bleeding patient comes into the hospital, what's the first thing you gotta do? And I think the answer is cauterize the bleeding. So to me, the only appropriate answer to that question is the President of the United States must enforce existing law, um, and which is why I'm all the more surprised by Professor Soman 
talking about this doctrine I've never heard of, the sauce is good only for this goose doctrine, that the, feder- the president can use authority that it's given, state can't use the exact same authority, and all- also the president can ignore what his existing obligations are under federal law. Until that is fixed, everything else, even the debates, the good faith debates we might need to have about how our federal statutes change, can't happen in good faith because there is no stasis, right? We, have, we don't really have any sense of what our law is now in a practical sense because what's on the books is just so divorced from the reality. We have to have a federal government that enforces those laws and to the extent they're too strict, to the extent we need more immigration judges, those conversations can happen down the road, but you have to cauterize the bleeding first. All right, I guess, Ilya? Yeah. So if I can make one reform, it would be this, uh, that instead of the current system where we have a presumption of exclusion of migrants, where people are only allowed to come in if the government gives them special permission, and in most cases, that permission is denied, I would replace it with the opposite system. There is a presumption of freedom of movement, that people can live and work where they want, unless there's some compelling reason to exclude them, like we have evidence they're planning to commit an act of terrorism or espionage or something of that sort. That would address the problems at the border. We would no longer have a vast illegal market and disorder and the like. It would also vastly benefit our economy for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Uh, And it would make it possible to enforce more of a rule of law, because in the current system, the issue is not that you know, the presidents are not doing anything or whatnot. It's that when you have a vast illegal market, it is simply not possible to enforce against more than a fraction of violators, just as it wasn't during prohibition. With alcohol prohibition, it was not, you could have said in 1933, before we consider liberalizing the alcohol laws, what we got to do is fully enforce alcohol prohibition. Well, that wasn't possible, certainly not at any morally acceptable cost. And the same thing is true uh, with the immigration law. Uh, today, and I would argue also with the war on drugs generally, uh, this is not really an immigration reform, but uh, I think I would have a similar approach to war on drugs that our uh, problems in that area are caused by drug prohibition, just as the problems with alcohol in the days of Al Capone were caused by alcohol prohibition. Uh, so, so much more could be said, but I know we're pressing as so, our time. So Matt, before I get to you, so I think it's been great because first we had Congress, then we had the executive branch, and I think what you just heard from Ilya is that the judges could solve all this I just by the penumbras the of judges. the due process clause. Yeah, I, 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 I didn't say to the, the judges, pre- I'm nor, joking nor, nor did I say, and I certainly didn't say it would be the due process clause. I know, I'm so then You have to answer about Matt, the deep you get statement. to go last. You, know, have no, you, have, you have no branches left, Matt, so what are you going to go with? Yeah, the fourth, the fourth branch. Yours is the fourth branch. That's true. Well, certainly you would enforce existing law. But notice the focus of the answers. It, it was on people who are not Americans. That's the answer to their question. This first thing is you do is help people who are not Americans, make it easier on them. The first thing I do is focus on the well-being of Texans, of Americans. I put their security and their well-being first. And when we do that, When Americans are at peace and secure and prospering, we are able to help the world more than any other country on the face of the earth. So when that person with the American flag on their shoulder or someone representing the American government shows up in that country, they know we're here to help and we know we have the capacity to help. But opening our borders and focusing on the rights of people who just want to disobey our law to get here however they can is the wrong approach. All right. Well, thank you all. Um, We went a little bit over, but I think it's been a really, really interesting engaging. So please join me in. Thanks to the panelists.